Hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne coming at you with your Bible Study Wednesday. How's everybody doing today? Good. You know, um, I am not sure when. I know you've been hearing plans about us, uh, you know, our regathering and having uh, some sort of uh, Sunday service uh, outdoors, indoors, whatever. Um, but don't know uh, how soon we're actually going to be doing these together. So um, uh, I hope you're used to this, this, because this is the way this is going to be for a little bit, apparently. So um, today we are in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 15. Now, last week, <laughs> in last week's episode... Absalom had been welcomed back into Jerusalem. David was happy to, uh, he was convinced that, you know, it's best that uh, he be here. David knew that Absalom was a threat. Remember, Absalom is his second son. He killed his first son. And... The narrator has made it very clear that Absalom is popular with the people. And so David is very aware that Absalom is a threat to uh, usurping the throne. But the way the narrator is telling it, the narrator is spending all this time because we, as the reader, are considered, like, we're, we're like with the narrator. We're like a, the, the, the reader who's like, uh, we're cheering for the same thing that the narrator is cheering for. Uh, remember, our narrator is very pro-David. And these stories of during David's kingship, which have everything to do with who's going to succeed him, are all about like, okay, this is the leader that God wanted for Israel. How is this leader going to maintain this realization long enough for the whoever the rightful heir who is supposed to actually come after David actually comes out actually comes so it's not gonna be Absalom by the way yeah exactly all right spoiler alert all right so we're in 2nd Samuel chapter 15 remember Absalom had just gotten re uh, look at the first look at the verse uh, the half verse before um, uh, the first verse of chapter 15. Now, look at the last half of the, the, the verse of, of the previous chapter, 14. What did it say? So he came to the king and prostrated himself, prostra prostrated himself with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. So Absalom did that. And look what happens in verse fifth, chapter 15, verse 1. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run ahead of him. Uh, so, yeah, it's like... Uh, the thing that David knew was going to happen. It's like, Absalom's making a play. He's making a play for the throne. And he starts to take on the repertoire, if you will, the accoutrement of uh, what a king does or an heir does. Like somebody who's very popular. And he is not afraid to be uh, ostentatious about it. Verse two, Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the road into the gate. And whenever anyone brought a suit before the king for judgment, 
Absalom would call out and say, from what city are you? When the person said, your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say, see, your claims are good and right, but there is no one disputed by the king, oh, disputed, deputed, deputed by the king to hear you. Absalom said, moreover, if only I were judge in the land, then all who had a suit or cause might come to me and I would give them justice. So, um, okay, one of the jobs of the king uh, was that the king was supposed to be like the, uh, the court. He is the judge also. And when to do that task, you go to the city gate and that's where you hear uh, what people bring to you. Apparently, this was not one of David's strengths. For all his, you know, David's wonderfulness, we don't have, well, I'm going to say it a different way. We have evidence here that this might not have been his bailiwick. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't a strength for him to the point that he wasn't even doing it. Obviously, there was a vacuum. There was some sort of a gap in what uh, uh, was available to people re with regard to getting the king's justice. And you know what? Absalom gets sucked right up in there because when you're making a play for the king, one, to be king, especially if you want to usurp the king, one way of doing it is looking at, well, what is one of those things that the king is supposed to do, but he's either weak at it or he's not doing it at all. This is that. All right. Verse 5, 2 Samuel 15, verse 5. Whenever people came near to do obeisance to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of them and kiss them. Thus Absalom did to every Israelite who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the people of Israel. This expression to steal the hearts. Um, I have a, a, a footnote here. Uh, it says stole the hearts or deceived. They, the expression uh, to steal the heart in the Semitic uh, parlance it is referring to deception, trickery, like uh, to, to steal the heart. A lot of times we use that expression like, oh, we just stole our hearts. It's like we weren't expecting it and boom, there we were. We like this guy. That's how we usually mean steal the heart. This is really much more not that. It's much more a... Uh, uh, a planned deception that worked. So, this is what is it, what do you call it when you are um, making uh, a play for the throne and it's not time for there to be, you know, there's no, yeah, it's not time. It's not time. It's not your time. A coup d'etat, the coup, a coup d'etat. That is a French expression. It literally means blow of the state, which is like an overthrow of the state. So it's uh, like Absalom seems to be putting in order 
a coup. Um, he's positioning himself with all the accoutrement. Remember the fifty, the fifty men and all of the chariots, or the, the chariot and the horses, and now acting as the king at the city gate, dispensing judgment. Okay. Verse seven, at the end of four years. So uh, interesting, right? At the end of four, so it's like Absalom was like, he was like plotting this and doing this for a while. It's not like, uh, it's not like it was just, we're not being told about just something that happened quickly or even recently, but it's like, oh, this is how he put himself in a position for people to say, oh, you know, I really like this guy. guy you know, he might actually be better than David. So, yeah. At the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow that I have made to the Lord. What was Hebron? Hebron was a place where this was, remember, this is the pre-temple times. Uh, there were high places there. High places were like places of worship that were uh, allowed before the pre-temple um, and uh, abundant even. But the ruse, it's kind of a ruse. Um, Absalom is using the ruse of a religious thing to really further his own plot, his own coup plot to overtake. It's an interesting uh, parallel in the, in the world. Religion is, does get co-opted uh, a lot by politicians, by people in power, because it plays to a sense of legitimacy and it takes some wisdom on the part of an individual to not play that card when it's insensitive or fear-mongering. This is an example of how that is not a new thing. It was not a new thing. Look what happens here. Okay. Uh, verse, verse eight. For your servant made a vow while I lived at Geshur in Aram. If the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, this is what his vow was. He's like, he, his vow is telling him, if the Lord, if you'll just bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will worship the Lord in Hebron. It's like, oh, so I have to go to Hebron to fulfill this vow because of the fact that God actually gave me what I asked. And so now I got to make good on my end of the deal. This is what he's saying. Verse nine, the king said to him, go in peace. So he got up and went to Hebron. Uh... Remember all those stories about David uh, when he was a young boy and he was, uh, you know, he was the heir apparent and he was the one uh, uh, like making all the right moves and Samuel says, you know what, you're going to replace Saul and David appeared to be so like uh, he was popular and uh, he, he was like always seeking the Lord in, in things and he seemed to know what uh, he needed to uh, take action on in order to uh, stay alive so that he could actually get to the throne. And now, as king, it's like, eh, not so much. Remember, things didn't go, all of this is in the wake of, remember the Bathsheba incident where it put in motion uh, petty jealousies and uh, yeah, soap opera-like uh, circumstances. It's like David's life 
He like he opened a door. He opened a door for drama that he had no idea how that that could happen, uh, how it could come about, and it's it is starting to run his life, especially when you consider the fact that he seems to be clueless. He seems to be. Let's stay tuned and see, is he going to wise up? Okay, all right. Very good. Uh, we are in verse 10. Uh, first, uh, 2 Samuel 15, verse 10. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, secret messengers. As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then shout, Absalom has become king in Hebron. What? Yeah. Uh, talk about your fake news. <laughs> uh, Absalom's plot was to put out this message that, oh, guess who's king now? Mm-hmm, Absalom. So here you go. Verse 11, 2 Samuel 15, verse 11. 200 men from Jerusalem went with Absalom. They were invited guests, and they went in their innocence, knowing nothing of the matter. Interesting. So he had some un knowing uh, participants who, uh, uh, who joined him. While Absalom was offering the sacrifices, we're in verse 12, uh, 2 Samuel 15, verse 12. He sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor from his city, Gilo. The conspiracy grew in strength, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. So the people that weren't, that were invited guests, that were innocent, they were there to just look, to, to, to give a, a look of legitimacy to this coup attempt by Absalom. And when we see that David's counselor, Ahithophel, Ahithophel, the Gilanite, joined with Absalom. We've never heard of this guy before, but our narrator is keen to say, basically, he's a traitor. He's a traitor. He was with David. Now he's, as they say, hitching his wagon with Absalom. And this is the beginning of his coup attempt. Pretty uh, intricate, huh? Uh, but just goes to show you this, this, you know, this, this is a new, uh, this kind of thing uh, has been going on for millennia, yes? Verse 16, or verse uh, 13. Uh, this, so now we're gonna get Okay, well, how's David gonna respond to all this? I mean, we did have an action of David in there in that he just said, oh yeah, sure, you wanna go to Hebron and fulfill your vow of the Lord? Go ahead, yeah, knock yourself out. But really, there was something afoot. But look here, verse 13, 2 Samuel 15, 13. A messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the Israelites have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him at Jerusalem, Get up, let us flee, or there will be no escape for us from Absalom. So David's response is, Ooh, we need to go into exile. We need to 
get out of town or we might be come food for worms very soon. So David's response is a response of saving his life. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen David do something like this where he's like, I got to get out of town to save my life, to save my future. We saw him do the same exact thing when a Saul was plotting against David. And here it comes back again. This seems to be one of those motifs of David's life that he's always getting himself into these situations where I gotta escape, I gotta get out. Interesting, think about this. You know how Jesus uh, frequently talked about, um, oh, it's not my time, or this isn't the time, or don't say anything, uh, that kind of thing. And frequently, he would have to escape situations for uh, him to preserve himself because there was a work that he knew he needed to do. But he knew that, oh, this isn't that time for me to die, basically. That was a pattern that David had in his life. Jesus frequently, you know, is referred to as son of David. People recognized him as the Messiah. We have the genealogies of Davidic descent. So uh, there's a lot, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of stuff that happens in David's life that's like, oh, that kind of sets a pattern for the way things would be with Jesus. And there are also some distinctive things that happen in David's life where it's like, oh, yeah, Jesus is not is the not that of that. Interesting. I hope you think I hope you think it's interesting anyway. Okay. Where were we? Get up, let us flee. Um, I'm in the middle of middle 14. Get up, let us flee, or there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Hurry or he will soon overtake us and bring disaster down upon us and attack the city with the edge of the sword. Yeah, he was grasping reality, which is good. Because as I've mentioned before, transformation, the beginning of transformation is a powerful relationship with what's so. What are the facts? David is gonna have to change something about the way he's been de doing his king, king stuff. And he's grasping the reality, oh yeah, disaster is afoot. Okay, verse 15. So, but, so well, um, so, so just pay attention to uh, what David's actions provide from here on out. Verse 15, the king's officials said to the king, your servants are ready to do whatever our Lord the king decides. So the king left, followed by all his household, except 10 concubines whom he left behind to look after the house. He leaves a lot of people behind who are very faithful and are very useful as uh, plants. They didn't have bugging devices back then. So what do you do? You leave people. Here's the beginning of that kind of thing with the 10 concubines. Verse 17, the king left, followed by all the people, all the people. <laughs> and they stopped at the last house. That last house, that's like a, 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 an expression meaning like, you know, on your way out of town, you know how there's like, there's that last house 
and now all of a sudden you're not in town anymore. So it's basically a way of saying uh, they had, you know, they were at the edge of town. They had, they had fleed. They had fleed. Had fleed. There you go. Verse 18. 2 Samuel 15, verse 18. All his officials passed by him, and all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the 600 Gittites. A Gittite? Who had followed him from Gath. Yeah, that's what you're called. If you're from Gath, you're a Gittite. From Phoenix, you're a Phoenician. You're from Gath, you're a Gittite. They passed on before the king. So it's interesting. These uh, Cherethites, Polythites, 600 Gittites, those were um, uh, uh, former enemies. Uh, you could almost call them natives, um, indigenous peoples, uh, people who were already there, who were in support of David, who were the Gittites. Where was Gath? Oh, well, that's Philistia. Yeah, those are Philistines. Those were Philistines. Do you remember when David was uh, on the run Early on, when he was preserving his life, he even joined up with the Philistines for a while. And he made a deal with some of the kings of the uh, Philistine cities. So here we see how that relationship is back. It's back. All right, verse 19. Then the king said to Ittai, the Gittite, we haven't seen Ittai before, but he gets introduced in the midst of David taking actions to make sure that he can keep his throne. Let's see what he does. Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, why are you coming with us? Go back and stay with the king. For you are a foreigner and also an exile from your home. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wander about with us while I go wherever I can? Go back and take your kinsfolk with you, and may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. So he's basically saying, you need to go back to Gath. Why are you with us? It's not fair for what you're going to have to go through with us. Just go back. And look what he says. Look what he says in verse 21. But Ittai answered the king, As the Lord lives, and as, the Lord, as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king may be, whether for life or for death, there also your servant will be. So he's like pledging he's a foreigner. He's one of them illegals. He's a foreigner. And he is basically pledging his solidarity with David. And he's basically casting his lot with David. And he's basically saying that, oh, I'm with you. All right. Remember, David doesn't have a very good history of exercising the kind of hospitality that the law required for resident aliens, foreigners, illegals, whatever you want to call them. Remember Uriah the Hittite? He stole his wife. And then had him killed. So David doesn't have a good record with that, but here we see one of those saying, I'm with you, David. And David is, what's his response? Verse 22, David said to Ittai, go then, march on. So Ittai the Gittite marched on with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. So this guy, like, hit his own army. So it's kind of valuable to have this kind of thing. 
But David had to test him to make sure that if you're really with me, I gotta know that you're really with me. So he really, he, he flung the door wide open for him to go back, he chose to stay. Verse 23, the whole country wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king crossed the Wadi Kidron and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. Abiathar came up and Zadok also, who were they? They were David's priests with all the Levites carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the Ark of God until the people had passed, had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back to let me see both it and the place where it stays. But if he says, I take no pleasure in you, here I am, let, me do, let him do to me what seems good to him. The king also said to the priest Zedek, look, go back to the city in peace, you and Abiathar with your two sons, Ahimaaz, your son, and Jonathan, son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem and they remained there. Interesting. So the priests... David's priests who were loyal to David, they were making a play for, oh, if we're leaving, if we're evacuating, we need to take the, this symbol of religious authority with us. Because that could be very valuable in our uh, retaining our position. And David's response, so we're all, all of a sudden we're actually seeing David make some shrewd, um, take some shrewd actions. And he's saying, no, I'm not gonna play that game. I don't need to use our religion as a prop for legitimacy. It's kind of a rather advanced notion if you think about it. It is an enlightened leader that doesn't feel that it's necessary to play that card. David here all of a sudden is like, eh, he's got some gumption. He's like, oh, this is a good choice. So, he's, so he says, no, we're leaving you here and the Lord sees to it that, you know, uh, it needs to come, you know, later it's like, he'll do it, but no, didn't do it here. Interesting. Okay. So they carried it back and they remained there. Oh, and they remained there. So I hope you just, so, so. Sorry about that. I hit the wrong button. Oh, so notice what happened. So we're in 2 Samuel uh, uh, 15, uh, verse uh, 29. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. So when, by them remaining there, oh, what do we have? We have more loyalists to David that are staying in the capital city, and that that becomes very valuable. Look at what he's gonna say here. Uh, but David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went with his head covered and walking barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went. Um, uh, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, uh, as you uh, go down, uh, to the valley of Kidron, if you're going east, well, yeah, the Mount of Olives. If you're gonna go, if you're leaving town and you're going east, where are you headed? You're headed toward like Jericho, you're headed toward like the River Jordan. You go down this uh, uh, valley, uh, the Wadi Kidron, and then, um, and then you go up a hill, and that hill is the Mount of Olives. 
and you can actually, when you're at the top of the Mount of Olives, you can see, you can actually look down on the Temple Mount because the Temple is, well, there's a Temple there, but um, that's a place from which Jesus was. Anyway, uh, so that's the, uh, the picture. They're, they're leaving, they're headed east into the egg, in self-exile. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, uh, with his head covered, walking in front of all the people were there recovered. Third. So uh, it was a very sad band of people, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, verse uh, 31. David was told that Ahitophel was among the conspirators with Absalom. Remember, Ahitophel was one of David's counselors who had defected. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray you, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. So <laughs> it's like, he, David valued this guy's counsel. <laughs> David thought this guy's counsel was good. But um, in this case, he's saying, well, now that he's working for the other guy, <laughs> may it all turn to dust. Verse 32, when David came to the summit where God was worshiped, so the summit of what? The summit of Mount Olives, the Mount of Olives. Um, yeah, people did that. Uh, they, they, um, there were a lot of, uh, any time in, in, in the old, in, in the old, those days, they, anytime you had a hill, a high spot, you set it up as a place of worship. The tops of hills were great for worship. And they weren't necessarily always with the God of Israel. And that's the reason why it just used the generic word God here, or deity. So there was a lot of worship going on at the top of the Mount of Olives. So they're going to do something like that. Look at this. When David came to the summit where God was worshipped, see, that's what, you, that's what you do at the summit. I'm not, I'm not saying that he necessarily did that, but that's, anyway. Hushai, Hushai, the archite, came to meet him with his coat torn and earth on his head. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that he just got in a fight and he was dirty. It means that he was mourning. He was a sympathetic uh, person to their plight. So it meant that he was with them and they didn't need to fear. So we have another one of these, uh, one of these foreigners joining in. Verse 33, David said to him, if you go on with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past. So now I will be your servant. Then you will defeat for me the counsel of Ahithophel. So this guy, Hushai, who we don't hear about, uh, uh, we don't hear, we'd never heard of him before. Um... The, um, yeah, see, see, we, don't, we don't know what his function was. But apparently, he was known to David. And so he's an example of somebody who did not turn tail and hook up, hook, hitch his wagon to Absalom. He did not. So now we have, uh, David thinking, oh, here's an opportunity. You can be a spy on the traitor, Ahithophel. So Hushai, David sees that Hushai is valuable. In it. So notice he prayed to God to make Ahithophel's counsel foolishness. And then what did he do? He took action. Isn't that an awesome uh, paradigm? 
He prayed to God and he took action. He didn't just say, well, let's just see what God does with this one. No. He takes action. An opportunity arose. Yeah. Prayer changes things. Because it gives you a new frame of reference by which you can then respond to the opportunities that are available to actually be in control of your experience of life. This is what is going on here. Verse 35. 2 Samuel 15, verse 35. The priests Zadok and Abiathar will be there with you. Oh, so David's got more than just He's got spies. These are spies. They're spying. So whatever you hear from the king's house, tell it to the priests, Zadok and Abiathar. Their two sons are with them there, Zadok's son, Ahimaaz, and Abiathar's son, Jonathan. And by them, you shall report to me everything you hear. David has got, he's set up an intelligence network. He's not just leaving town because, with his tail caught between, tucked between his legs. Like, oh, wow. No, he's like, okay, this is a part of a strategy for us to survive. And he puts in place an intelligence network that will keep him informed of what's going on with Absalom. Very, uh, it's very interesting to see David taking some actions that actually work. So Hushai, verse 37, David's friend, came into the city just as Absalom was entering Jerusalem. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, that's the idea. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, writer is uh, giving us that kind of a, a sense of like, this is the situation, David just got everything set up, and look who's coming into town, that guy. I think it's a great story. Um, uh, that's all we're gonna do today. I'm trying to keep it down to just one chapter because um, I don't think two chapters is too much. Hey, uh, we're gonna do a prayer. Um, we're gonna pray the, pray the prayers of Compline, uh, but I, uh, All right, here we are. You got your, uh, you got your prayer book? It's uh, page 127, 127. 127, the prayers of Compline. Prayers of Compline. Lord Almighty, grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sin to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. We're going to do this short one on page 131, uh, the Psalm 134 on page 131. Behold now, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, you that stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift your hands, lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord, the Lord who has made heaven and earth. Bless you out of Zion. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. 
Amen. Lord, you are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us, O Lord our God. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night. And give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless us and keep us. Amen. Good night, everybody.